All right. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this session, uh, second of the day of the uh, 2020 Shrug Virtual Work GIS Workshop. We uh, appreciate everybody's attendance um, coming yesterday and coming back today. I know it's not the same thing as meeting in Tallahassee and doing the the networking with everybody and talking and joking and swapping up stories that happened over the last year. Uh, but I think we're doing a really good job here, getting a lot of good feedback, and we appreciate everybody's support. We also like to um, give the thanks to our support for our sponsors. As you see there on our slide, our platinum sponsors. Um, I'm actually the, the treasurer of Shrug, and when the board said they want to do a virtual conference, I says, okay, that, that's good. And then they said, and we want to provide it free for everybody. I was like, okay, that, that's not good. Uh, but because of the support of these sponsors here uh, and, our, and our various sponsors we've had, we are able to provide this free of charge to you. Uh, and that's a, a big accomplishment. So we're really appreciative of our sponsors with that. Uh, with a presentation here, we you'll see on the uh, the side control there is a question box. So if you have a question throughout the presentation, type it in there, and we will answer the questions at the end of the presentation. Um, I always find it better to, if you have a question, go ahead and type it in when you have it, because you might forget it by the end. So do type your questions in throughout, and we will answer them at the end. We do have a hard stop though at 11:30, so we will have to finish up at 11:30. Um, any questions that weren't answered by that time, um, I've already talked to Amber and Deidre, and they're more than happy to, if you reach out to them, to answer those questions at that time. Uh, so with all those announcements, uh, let's go ahead and get started. This is a uh, good session here that I've, I've been looking forward to because it's something I'm going to be working on pretty soon, and that's mapping historic cemeteries in downtown Pensacola. Uh, some of our pre-conference, our pre-talking uh, we've had, getting a little bit of insight and such, so it's a very exciting uh, thing. So Amber, I'm going to go ahead and change you to presenter so you may be able to share your screen. All right, so you should be able to see a presentation slide. Yeah, we do. Okay, perfect. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Amber Blakely, accompanied by my colleague, Deidre Hunter. Hi. We're, we're pleased to share a project that the University of West Florida's Geodata Center recently completed, involving the mapping of a few historic cemeteries near downtown Pensacola. We were contracted twice by the University's Historic Trust and the Archaeology Institute to map three local cemeteries this year. And faculty researcher Margaret Stringfield in particular has been conducting research and working closely with Escambia County to manage these sites for several years now. Up until now, they relied on lists of people buried here to uh, conduct research and field visits to manage damage assessment. And all three Cemeteries have benefited from cleanup by Keep Pensacola Beautiful and local volunteers. Margot and her team knew that mapping these sites in GIS would not only make their jobs easier, but that details of these sites might be preserved and appreciated by the community for years to come. While we were mapping these cemeteries, uh, we were approached by several people either visiting the cemetery or who live nearby. And they were all pleased to hear about our efforts and looked forward to being able to find their loved ones and ancestors on a map one day. Um, our, our work began in March of this year when we mapped the Mount Zion Cemetery for sinks or places where graves and trees had fallen, leaving dips in the ground. Then between April and August, we mapped, uh, starting at that time, uh, we mapped AME Zion and Magnolia Cemeteries for any and all burial sites that we could recognize. And this, pre this presentation focuses primarily on the larger AME Zion and Magnolia cemeteries, which are adjacent to each other. It's important to point out that we are not archeologists. Um, we didn't know what we were looking at in the field on several occasions and leaned on our college, colleagues at the Institute to guide us. And we learned a lot throughout this process. The team on this project included me and my colleague, uh, colleagues Deidre Hunter, Mike Fazio, and Lee Judevine. I'll hand it over to Deidre now to explain a bit more about why mapping these cemeteries are important for our communities and for further research. So the question comes up of why do we just map cemeteries to begin with? And there are a few key points as to why. Uh, there are many others that I'm not going to touch on, but uh, these were kind of the few that were pointed out to us. Um, these cemeteries are mapped for historical preservation, 
Many of these places can be resting places of local or national historic figures. They can have historical significance, such as burials resulting from mass events like yellow fever or Spanish flu, or they can represent historical changes in time. These cemeteries can also be the only green spaces in a developed community and must be managed for the public benefit. Mapping can identify problem areas in these cemeteries that need to be addressed for public safety and so the public can continue to enjoy visiting um, these places and their relatives. And then with the gaining popularity of DNA research with Ancestry or 23andMe, or if there's another one that has popped up, um, people are taking more interest in their ancestors and they want to know just where they are. Uh, mapping helps make that search easier so they know specifically where to go and not just, oh, it's somewhere in this cemetery that has a thousand graves. Um, Mapping also helps to correct incomplete information. Find a Grave, which is an online cemetery database, only lists 652 marked graves in AME Zion, and it's uh, based loudly, largely on crowdsourcing. Um, a local survey of AME Zion by a Girl Scout in May 2002 identified 1,423 recognizable grave sites while our survey had less at 1,304. This discrepancy can be the focus of further research at this location. It might just be that the graves were lost to time and the forces of nature, which just reinforces why mapping these areas are important so that no more graves are lost. So um, to give some context on why these particular cemeteries were chosen to be mapped, and why we chose to collect certain data, um, you need to know a little bit about the history. Um, both of these cemeteries are historical African-American burial locations. AME Zion was established around 1886 by a land purchase by the AME Burial Association. Um, Magnolia Cemetery was established around the same time, but there's not as much information available. The Burial Association was active after the Civil War in Pensacola, and the purpose of establishing this cemetery was to ensure that people of color received a dignified funeral and burial. Many of the oldest graves were former slaves or the children of former slaves. Beyond that direct connection, many of the people buried here lived during segregation. It is important that these people not be forgotten, and we approach this project with the utmost respect. Um, our contact in archaeology told us that vernacular markers, um, shown here on the slide as two examples, um, are pretty prevalent in African American cemeteries. The vernacular marker is handmade and range from very simple, just the name written in concrete, to very ornate with artwork and shells and beads pressed into the concrete. These handmade markers can communicate respect, fellowship, family, church, and cultural tradition. Two examples again are shown here. The one in the top right um, is more simple, um, just the name kind of written with a stick in the concrete, whereas the uh, lower one has this artwork, um, some symbols pressed into it, and the name again handwritten. And we might show some examples later that show shells. All right, so it's time to explain our methods. In these photos, Deidre and I are fresh and optimistic at the beginning of the project, mapping a burial site using a Samsung tablet, which was connected to an MLID Reach RS Plus GPS receiver through the Reach application and collector for ArcGIS. We chose this unit because of its ability to collect sub-centimeter accuracy for burial sites, which are fairly close together on the ground. And the unit required a hotspot to connect to the Reach app and then another device to connect to the Collector app. To help achieve greater accuracy, the GPS receiver was used in conjunction with a correction service provided by the Florida Department of Transportation. And eventually we ditched the bulky tablet in favor of collecting data from our Android and Apple smartphones. There were many trees at the cemetery, which posed a big challenge for us to collect accurate data points. 
In several instances under the tree canopy, we manually place points on the ground using base map imagery as a guide and ground truthing skills. Scheduling time in the field during favorable conditions proved a difficult task when juggling, uh, juggling work and parenting from home. Um, and so to save time, only a portion of the collector form was entered in the field and the rest was transcribed remotely. So we established our field methodology during a smaller Mount Zion project and refined them to meet the needs of the larger AME Zion and Magnolia project. The methods we used to map burial sinks at Mount Zion went very smoothly and ultimately we underestimated the time it would take to complete the larger cemeteries. GPS point features were collected at the northwest corner of each suspected grave site or marker using Esri's collector app and we used our best judgment to identify grave sites for data collection. It could be um, you know, something as simple as a brick on the ground. It could be something more obvious or something leaned up against the tree. Again, we just, we saw it, we collected it. Try not to question it too much. Um, for instance, if there was a gap between two grave sites, we would probe the ground with the end of a metal flag to see if a slab could be easily felt underground. And if it hit a hard surface, we collected the point using our best guess where the marker might, where the marker might fall. Um, and there are likely many more grave sites that need to be um, identified using special equipment. The Archaeology Institute provided us with a manual they created, which gave great guidance for data inputs. Their previous mapping efforts at the St. Michael Cemetery, which is a well-known historical cemetery in Pensacola, provided us with insight on what worked and what didn't in terms of data structure and how the data set will be used um, you know, later on by researchers and eventually the community. We created the collector form with input from the Institute to collect location, uh, which primarily focused on burial structure details and the data from the headstones or markers as accurately as possible. Several headstones included really long inscriptions, um, and a lot of the times they were weathered, uh, which made them difficult to read without conservation or special tools. Um, so we, we didn't do that part. Uh, we revisited data collection expectations throughout the project, especially as we hit challenges and near deadline goals. No one on our team had ever built an index for a cemetery before, but we knew we wanted to use one to help with the collection efforts. Burial sites at these cemeteries aren't in a nice line. They're more or less meandering in several areas, which made it hard to approach the idea of using a rigid index system. We actually leaned on a recent graduate of our GIS administration master's program here at UWF, who works for the US Veteran Affairs um, National Cemeteries. So Samuel Song, he provided the diagram included at the top right of the screen where gravesite numbering starts over at each row so that the numbers don't get too large within the data set. And instead of using the term rows, we used lanes instead, which kind of speaks more to how the sites meander or why off instead of staying within a straight row. Now to develop the index, we walked the cemetery's southernmost borders and counted 32 gravesites. And then in ArcGIS Pro, the lanes were created by generating 32 equidistant points, roughly 9.75 feet apart on the northern and southern parcel boundaries. Then each point was connected to its opposite counterpart. Lane numbers and grave numbers are incorporated in the grave ID field in our data set. Ultimately, the index helped us reference points on the ground and communicate locations in the field with Deidre and Lee, who are working remotely, and it worked out really well. Um, Deidre, do you want to explain how we set up the project in uh, ArcGIS Online? Sure. So we decided to create and host this project in ArcGIS Online for the ease of sharing and transferring ownership of this data we completed. Um, we created a group for this project with group editing privileges, and since we were all working remotely, we collaborated via video calls and Google Chat. And then further on that, we chose to use Collector, 
because it would be easy to edit files and change owners when the project was done. We had difficulties changing ownership of Survey123 forms in past projects and decided just to avoid that altogether. Domains and lists were used heavily for consistent data entry and ease of use in the field. And we wound up editing our domains and fields a few times after the first couple of field days to better reflect our process and how things worked in the field. Uh, for example, if we had uh, the condition of um, the grave assessment lower in the list below some things that we would do uh, remotely, we moved that field up in the data set so the field people didn't have to scroll all the way down, just making things more efficient. Um, and we created default values for common fields. Um, slab present was always no, unless there was a slab present, then the person in the field could just change it to yes. Uh, next slide. And so uh, each cemetery has its own layers and maps, but both shared the same structure. Um, this is just to reduce file size because uh, these files got very large very quickly. Uh, the web maps shared to our group and configured to collector to allow edits and offline modes. And each gravesite has at least one photo attached. Um, many have two or more. So our data set has probably over 2,000, maybe 3,000 pictures for each cemetery. Uh, and the photos needed to be large and high quality for later transcription um, at home. And we use Collector for ArcGIS for the initial field collection. Um, you can see that as in the top set of screenshots. And then Collector Classic was used for the field edits. That's the bottom set of screenshots. Uh, the different interfaces had pros and cons that made each suitable for each one we chose. Um, classic was a little better for editing just because you could see some information when you click the point that you couldn't see in um, ArcGIS Collector. So um, it just uh, made things a little easier in the field. Yeah, I remember one thing that was uh, sort of frustrating at times is that uh, the app looks different between an Apple device and an uh, Android device. Um, just another thing. <laughs> we could have saved ourselves um, quite a bit of time if we had thought to create later views before building our dashboard the first time. So we decided to share this tidbit now. Um, first, it's important to consider early on who will be accessing the dashboard. Most of the dashboard users for this project don't have AGO accounts, so it needed to be shared publicly to allow users and stakeholders to view it. Um, we were using editable layers, so anyone on our team could, to, could edit the items. However, if you share editable layers publicly, then anyone could edit them. So the solution is to create layer views of your editable layers and build the dashboard with those so others can't edit your data. So just a quick look into how we did field assessment of grave sites. Um, you see several grave sites pictured here. The first one is what we considered a grave in good condition. It's not leaning, it's not broken. It might be dirty, but that's okay. Um, the headstone is standing and legible. So this and graves in similar condition is what we considered good. Uh, the next one is fair condition. You can see that this headstone is leaning. There might be some missing stones for this enclosure, but again, that's okay for this purpose. It's fair. Um, somebody should look at uh, providing some conservation for this gravesite before it becomes poor condition. Um, so this fair condition identifies that areas that are potential problems and should be looked at sooner rather than later. And then there are two examples of poor condition. Um, these grave sites need immediate conservation. The one on the far right is one of the first graves we saw. Um, we notified archaeology immediately when we saw this grave in such poor condition, and they came out and covered it with a tarp um, immediately. But graves like this, in addition to 
not being respectful to who is buried there. Also pose a public hazard. Somebody could fall in, um, an animal could get trapped in there, some, something like that. And then the next one to the left, you can see that that's partially buried. And this one is also an example of a, of a vernacular one. And so if this grave headstone becomes completely buried, then this grave might very well be lost. And so it's important to come out and get this headstone lifted above the soil and into a proper position so that it is not lost in the future. So we had a lot of graves to collect and not a lot of field time to do it. Um, COVID started. I personally moved out of state. Our fourth team member wasn't able to have any field time. And so we decided early on to only collect grave ID, photo, and do marker and condition assessment in the field. The rest was performed remotely. I did my portion of transcriptions in ArcGIS Online while my colleague preferred to do it in ArcGIS Pro. We used the photos that we took for transcription and used their photos to also remotely verify point placement and any points that need to be revisited, um, kind of using other graves that were visible in the photos to compare to the points that we had and see, is this point in the right place? Um, the grave IDs were also updated for any field typos and the designator of Z or M was added for each cemetery, Z for Zion or M for Magnolia. Um, each one, while each one had its own map in the dashboard, they would both be displayed on uh, one map. So it was important for later display rather than field use. So aside from some of the issues we saw with collecting data under the trees, the biggest headache that we had with this project involved collecting photos. As Deidre mentioned, we had uh, a lot of photos. So several times we had to wait for our phone to cool off in order to collect more photos, but that was really the least of our worries. Um, we collected over 2,000 grave sites and we're collecting one to two photos for each site, sometimes more. Um, so photos are stored as attachments in the data set with limited editing options. Um, we found a way to using Python to create a new field that listed the number of photos collected. This way we could easily filter or select points with only one photos or, or two, or maybe there should have been two. We experienced space issues and data sync failures with our Collector Classic. We were using the offline mode, uh, which performed faster for editing and, and collecting, um, because the image files were attached later with a Wi-Fi connection. But on one particularly long and hot day, um, hundreds of photos were lost when photo syncs failed in the field when collecting offline. And an attempt was made to sync over hotspot, but it continued to fail every time. And Esri Tech Support assisted us by helping locate the source files on the device and restoring them within an ArcGIS Pro. And we were able to retain the data points, but found that many attachments were lost or scrambled in the process. So all of those sites had to be revisited and new photos collected. So our, uh, our learning experience from this was that we should collect data online with 10 minute sync interval set on the application. And as a safeguard, we also manually synced new points and photos every five grave sites. Luckily, we were in a location with good phone service. Our collector has changed since this project. It changed during the project. Um, we can only recommend using AGO with collector for a small scale project where many photos are required. So this is a snapshot of our operations dashboard. We're going to open it in just a second. Uh, this dashboard is mainly for internal use at the moment. Um, the key elements uh, focus on military burials, sites with uh, vernacular condition of the markers, and sites that require expertise from an archaeology team member, um, something that we weren't sure what we were looking at, and so we need somebody who actually knows to come out and uh, identify what's being seen. 
And then we also added information such as grave counts and the range of death years. And so right away, you can see the grave count for each cemetery. Um, so between the two, there's a total of 2,300 something graves. Um, each site had over a thousand. Uh, these needs review, that's the sites that need a member of the archaeology team members to come out. And overall, they represent a fairly small portion of the total grave sites, so I'm pretty proud of that. Um, just below that, you see the pie chart, and this just shows the proportions of um, grave conditions, good, fair, and poor. Um, in both cemeteries, um, the majority is good. The pie chart you're looking at right now is for Magnolia. Um, there's slightly more that are fair than poor, but these poor ones will need to be addressed. Um, over to the right here, uh, you can see the distribution of death years in Magnolia. You can see that they, the highest um, active time was between kind of the late 40s through the 50s and into the end of the 60s is when it kind of tapers off. And then if we switch to Zion, um, you can see that this one wasn't very act, it was in existence but not very active until the mid 60s. And then that's when uh, the majority of the graves there um, came into existence uh, mid 60s into the late 70s and kind of tapered off with the oldest being around um, 2006 and nothing, nobody else has been buried there since the mid 2000s. And then um, we also created some queries for archaeology, um, broken down by cemetery, um, kind of hitting the key points that they were looking for. Uh, is vernacular present? Is there a military burial? Um, is further review needed? And then just sorting graves by first name. And I've uh, picked out a couple for us to look for. Um, so Amber, if you want to look in Zion at a uh, military and find Adrian Sims, Z26037. Yep. So this man is Adrian Sims. He was actually a veteran of both world wars. If you want to scroll down to the picture, Amber. I believe the second one has a closer up view. Might be a little hard to see in the screen sharing, but World War I and II, um, that's one very rare in general, but two for it to likely be um, an African-American man um, who served in both world wars is really something kind of rare. Um, this grave is in good condition and uh, he's buried around members of his family. So uh, we hope he has a good uh, rest in whatever comes after. Um, so the next one, Amber is, you're not going to find that one in the queries. Um, it's Z16020. And so, um, yeah. Did I click on it the first time? I think you did. Yep. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to scroll down on this one, well, first, you see the first name there is just Amb. So something about this grave isn't readable. Uh, so scroll down a little bit more. You see that this one is in poor condition. And this is one of the headstones that are leaning up against the tree. Uh, something's happened to it and somebody just picked it up and propped it up against the tree. So somebody's going to need to figure out where this headstone goes and um, put it back in its proper place. And I'm not sure how well you can see this on your screen, but you can kind of make out some of the lettering there. You see the A over there on the left, and 
Yeah, I think that's most of the ones that need review. We found that just the lettering, it was just incomplete. You know, it's hard to read because of being weathered like this one. Mm. Yeah, or hard to read on the computer, something that you might be able to tell what it says if you were actually out there. And it... um, so then, Amber, if you want to go to M15001. Very first one. Uh, Aaron Johnson, yep. And so uh, this one has some nice vernacular, if you want to scroll down to the picture. This is the one that I spoke of earlier. These are either shells or rocks. So it's a little hard to tell from the picture, but um, this uh, headstone was obviously handmade with some love. Yeah, I really enjoyed seeing these out there. We got to know some of the names pretty well as we were trying to find things along the way. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, the last one that I have picked out is M20036. Okay, 36, it's gonna be up here. Yeah. My round so, uh, 31, 34. 36. 36, yep. Um, and so this just also kind of indicates how our indi indexing system works. So uh, the first letter we can pick out which cemetery, the, the first two numbers show us our lane, and then the last three indicate um, where kind of north-south in the lane it is. So if you want to scroll down on this one, Amber. This one is another one that's in kind of poor condition. Um, click to the second picture. Um, it's just kind of a slab. If you go back one, you can kind of see where there used to be a headstone and it's no longer legible or missing. And so this one uh, needs to be reviewed by somebody from archeology span again. Okay. And if anybody has any questions, if we have time at the end, we can come back and explore this dashboard a little more. All right, so we completed this project on August 31st and Hurricane Sally hit Pensacola a little over two weeks later on September the 16th. And as you can see, there are, are several trees down. So we really got this project done in the nick of time. Um, it also, was why uh, we haven't been able to revisit some of those sites we've mentioned before that needed some ground truthing. Um, so GIS faculty at the Institute were able to use the framework we developed for the cemetery along with guides and how-to videos that we developed as part of this project to develop a collector form for post-Sally Cemetery damage assessment, uh, which was really neat. And our work will certainly help to manage the cemetery a bit easier, and especially with regards to needs-based funding. Um, it looks like we have just a couple of minutes to share our bonus material on the Mount Zion sinks portion of this project. Again, this project went smoothly, so there isn't a whole lot to get into. Um, we were tasked with mapping sinks at the cemetery, which are basically, again, holes or dips in the ground that make it unsafe for visitors to walk around the cemetery. Um, and the Institute worked with the county to, um, to get the dirt and to fill it in. Oh no. I wonder why I'm having to sign in. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> All right, so for the burial sinks, um, I guess I should explain this why you could still see it on the screen, but we used the calculation for one half of the volume of an elliptical cylinder and then for the free for the tree fall type, um, which they're a little more regular, regular in shape, we use the volume of a cube. And initially, the Institute staff flagged all the locations we needed to map, which was estimated to be around 125 sites total. And this really cut out a lot of the guesswork for us. 
burial sites are symbolized in blue and account for uh, the sinks um, there can are blue and account for the most sinks that need to be filled in. Uh, tree fall sinks are green and then mixed. It might be a tree fall and it might be a burial. Um, those are in pink and then unknown is in orange. We calculated a total area of just over 350 square meters of sinks and converted it to cubic yards to order the fill dirt. Um, well, I hope you guys enjoyed our presentation and we're happy to take any questions that you might have at this time. All right. Thank you very much. That was very informative. Very, uh, very good. I got a lot of notes I've been writing down and I'll probably be following up with you as I'm sure other people have. Uh, we do have a few questions that came in. Uh, one is, do you have a uh, problem entering dates? What do you do if only um, you have a year, no month or day? All right, so Amber, if you want to just maybe pull up one of the, uh, well, let me zoom up, to it. I select it. Pull up, no. uh, pull up Adrian Sims again, because he's a military one, so he's going to have some good data. Okay. So, uh, and then scroll down a little bit, Amber. So we actually broke each component of um, the dates up into month, day, and year. So month was a drop down. Um, he doesn't have a birth month and he doesn't have a birthday. Apparently he doesn't have any birth information. Yeah, sorry, I put up the wrong one. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Here we go. Here's, here's Adrian Sims. So uh, the birth month was December. Um, we had it in this format because um, often um, the headstones varied sometimes on if it uh, had just the month number or the spelled out version. So it was easier in the field just to have both. So we weren't trying to count uh, months in our head as we were out there. And then day was also a drop down, 1 to 31. Um, birth year was a manual entry because we weren't quite sure what the ranges would be before we started this project. And it would be a very long scrolling list from the 1880s through 2000, the mid 2000s, if we had a list. And then um, the death dates are set up in the same way with uh, month, day, and year, month and day being a drop down list and year being an entry. I got it. So instead of having just a, a full date in one field, you data dictionary, you have a broken out into each part of the date. So in case there's something missing, you're not stopped right. in the progress. Good right. Deal. Because often um, play, people had maybe just their birth year, but no month and day. Sometimes they just had the month and the year and no day. So it made it easier to account for the information that was there. Good. Uh, next two questions we have are, are about planning, so I'm going to kind of put them together. Um, the first one says, are you familiar with the efforts of City of Tallahassee uh, in logging their cemetery data? Uh, and the other one, are any plans to map St. John's Cemetery in Pensacola, established in 1873 in the future, or 1876? Um, so, no, I'm not personally familiar with any cemetery mapping happening in Tallahassee. Are you, Deidre? I am not. Okay. And then, um, you know, I imagine that our archaeology institute, they would love to map, you know, so many cemeteries <laughs> within Pensacola. And, you know, again, like we were minimally involved in the St. Michael Cemetery mapping, which is a well-known cemetery I mentioned earlier. Um, and then these are just the second two that we've done since then. And I think, you know, I was mapping St. I was using some of that data when I was a student. Uh, several years ago. So for us to be mapping these two right now, um, you know, hopefully we'll get to do more. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, another set of questions are kind of related, so I'm going to throw them out there kind of together. Uh, one talks about with uh, collecting your point using a GPS, did you center your point on the headstone or if there was a perceived center of the grave? 
Uh, and then kind of addition to that, you're talking about the tree coverage being a problem. Would using a laser range finder help in, um, help in mapping when the tree cover causes problems with your GPS signal? Okay, so uh, the first question, I can take that one. Uh, we were asked to collect on the northwest corner of every site, and most of our graves were facing east. So we would just go right to that corner every single time. Um, I, I've seen some examples where the center of the, of the site where it was used, um, but I think the north, that, that, east, that northeast corner, that was one that um, I think archeologists use that whenever they're referencing things that they're uh, studying and they're doing their digs. So I, I think that's why we ended up using that. Is that what you remember, Deidre? I think so. Um... It was more, we were instructed to use the Northwest corner. Um, we didn't have much input on where to put it. And so we did what archeology span asked us to do. <laughs> that was a good role to do. <laughs> uh, and next question is, how will this data be used? Will it be available public or is it for research only? I think right now it's just being used internally, but eventually they would like to offer this up to the community to be able to use it. Yeah. Um, and then I think we skipped over one of the questions just so we hit on that one. Um, in the beginning of this project, we went back and forth on whether or not we should use a total station to map uh, the cemetery, but ultimately uh, it was kind of due to the budget and the time constraints, um, you know, we knew it would be faster for us to be able to collect using the unit that we did. So certainly it, it probably would have been um, I guess more accurate for us to use another type, other types of equipment. It just would have taken more time. Ah, uh, yes, that and the rangefinder total station. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, and generally, you know, as long as we can find the location on the ground, um, that was something that was that was really important. You know, if they want to come back out and do a whole survey of the site, then you know, take in another time. Looks like we might have time for one more question. Um, the data dictionary, was it one that you developed yourself or is, a, is there a standard one out there for documenting cemeteries? Um, we developed it ourselves with guidance from the PACT manual that Amber mentioned. Uh, the PACT manual was something that the archaeology team created uh, while they were doing St. Michael's Cemetery and they identified kind of some key aspects that they wanted to notes such as the names, the inscription, um, kin terms, things like that. And then um, in con consultation with archaeology, we added in um, the military and uh, some other things. So Amber just pulled up the PACT manual. Uh, the form that I used was at the very end, Amber, uh, one of the appendix appendices. Oh, right there. Oh, oh yes, this one. Right here. Yep. So um, this is an example of collector kind of replacing paper. Um, you can only imagine what a binder that would be if all of these were handwritten by paper and then had to be inputted into a database. But um, so this is what they used when they were doing St. Michael's. And so um, you can see that it pulled in a lot of the things that you might have seen as we kind of scrolled through some of the example graves, uh, photographs. Uh, we did not measure the headstones. Um, that wasn't important for this project. Archaeology may come back at a later time and do this, but they were more concerned about location and condition assessment, not um, headstone measurement. Um, we noted the inscription, kin terms, non-kin terms. Um, we didn't include a description too much. We might have in notes if we noticed something like a mason symbol. Um, we noted the marker material and the condition, the dates, and the names. 
Okay, good information. I think um, that's about all of our time that we have. Uh, a few other comments I just want to pass on to you. There was a comment that says, awesome, thank you. And someone else did comment, thank you for representing the city of Pensacola. Oh, so, thanks so I, much. You're welcome. I do appreciate a lot of great information. Like I said, I know with my project that I have coming up, I'll probably be reaching out, and I'm sure others that were in, in the presentation will be as well. A lot of good work you're showing there and good use of collector and other technology in, in gathering this often forgotten and, and hidden sometimes uh, data and information that's right there in plain sight within our cemeteries. Uh, with that, this will conclude this session. And I want to thank everybody for attending, and uh, our next sessions will be starting soon. So look at your schedule and get logged into your next session. Thank you all. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye, everyone.